All right, so 4.3 is on the addition rule. And uh, to understand the addition rule, we need to make sure that we understand what a compound event is. So just like you would think compound, meaning more than one, a uh, compound event is any event combining two or more simple events. A compound event is any event combining two or more simple events. So the notation for a compound event, if you have two events, you can think about it like the probability of A or B. All right, And that's equal to the probability that in a single trial, event A occurs or event B occurs, or they both occur. All right. Let's look at this example that relates back to the chap chapter problem. Um, I believe there's one here. So here's our table, I believe, that we have to use for one of the examples we'll look at. Let's see. All right, and I can go back to the table, but let's look at this real quick. If one subject is randomly selected from the thousand subjects given a drug test, find the probability of selecting a subject who had a positive test result or uses drugs. Probability of a positive test result or uses drugs. So here's our table. Now, if I want to know the probability of a positive test result, then that would be uh, 44 plus 90 divided by the total number, 1,000. If I just wanted the probability that someone uses drugs out of this 1,000, I'd say 44 plus 6, and then divide by 1,000. But I want the probability of a positive test result or the person uses drugs. And so I have to be careful that I don't count this true positive twice. I need to just count it once whenever I find my probability. All right, if I just took this column, took that number, and then took this row and that number, then I would have counted the 44 twice. So to find this probability, what am I going to do? I'm going to say it's going to be 44 plus 90, and then subject uses drugs was 44 and 6 so plus 6 then divide by 1000 all right so that's going to be Why would that divide by 1000 there are 1000 total in the table all right so that's going to be 140 divided by 1000 I wouldn't leave my probability like that. That's not a real pretty fraction. I mean, you could even make it 14 over 100, but still, I'd use a calculator. All right, so 0.14. That's the probability, so that would be 14%. If you randomly selected one person, that that person would have a positive test result or that person uses drugs. And of course you could come up with all kinds of, of uh, problems with the information from this table. All right, your book does say, and this is in bold so it must be important, that when finding the probability that event A occurs or event B occurs, find the total number of ways A can occur and find the total number of ways B can occur. But find that total in such a way that no outcome is counted more than once. That's what I'm, I was talking about. You don't want to count that same number, that 44, twice. Okay. 
Now formally, in a formal math class, you would be taught that the probability of A or B is equal to the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. What that subtracting does is it gets rid of that value that would be counted twice. Okay. Um, but intuitively, to find the probability, this is what I would suggest that you do. It says to find the probability of A or B, find the sum of the number of, of ways event A can occur and the number of ways event B can occur, adding in such a way that every outcome is only counted once. The probability of A or B is equal to that sum divided by the total number of outcomes in the sample space. Okay. The addition rule is simplified when the events are disjoint. So that means that they don't they can't possibly happen at the same time. We were just looking at an example when something could happen in two different times. Um, let's look at the definition of disjoint and what disjoint means. Events A and B are disjoint or mutually exclusive if they cannot occur at the same time. That is, disjoint events do not overlap. Right, disjoint events do not overlap. For example, let's say that I wanted to know the probability that if I randomly selected one person in this class that they were or they vote Democratic or Republican. All right, I can't usually, one, not all the time, but I would say usually people vote one way or another, like a straight ticket. Sometimes there may be some differences, but most people would classify themselves as Democrat, Republican, or other, maybe some type of independent. Um, I can't choose someone in here and them be Democrat and Republican. Those um, two events are disjoint. They do not overlap. Okay. Which is the first example here, example number two. Example of disjoint events. Randomly selecting someone who is a registered Democrat. Randomly selecting someone that is a registered Republican. The selected person cannot be both. So here's some examples of not or non-disjoint events. Randomly selecting someone who is taking a statistics course. Randomly selecting someone who is a female. Those can overlap, right? So those are not disjoint. The selected person can be both, right? See if we can find a few more of those to look at. Let's see. All right, let's look down at these couple problems. All right, so let's see if you can figure out are the two examples disjoint or are they not disjoint. Number five, arriving late for your next statistics class, arriving early for your next <coughs> statistics class. It would be pretty tough to arrive late and early for a class, so that is uh, disjoint. Number six, asking for a date through a Twitter post, <laughs> asking for a date in French, the romantic language. So I believe that those definitely um, could both happen at the same time, right? You could ask for a date through French language. Um, so those are not disjoint. Okay. Number seven, randomly selecting a survey respondent and getting someone who believes in UFOs. Randomly selecting a survey respondent and getting someone who believes in the devil. Okay. Those could definitely happen at the same time. Someone could believe in the devil and UFOs, so they are not disjoint. Disjoint, remember, are events that do not overlap. Okay, so number seven was not disjoint. Number eight, randomly selecting a statistics student who is, or and getting one who uses a TI calculator in class. Randomly selecting a statistics student and getting one who uses the StatDisk computer program. Those could definitely overlap so they are not disjoint. It's almost like you could take the dis away. They're jointed, <laughs> right? You can do both. You don't have to, but
but you could. Number nine, randomly selecting a drug screening result and getting one that is a false negative. Randomly selecting a drug screening result and getting one from someone who is not a drug user. Okay, so I don't think you could have a result and, or have a false negative and not be a drug user at the same time, not if you're talking about one person. So number nine would be disjoint. Then 10, randomly selecting a drug screening result and getting one that is a false positive. Randomly selecting a drug screening result and getting one from someone who uses drugs. So can, you, can we select one person from that chart earlier and then have a false positive and also be someone who uses drugs? Okay. It's talking about, you would think about these for, uh, as two events during one single trial. So can I select you and you be a person who in the test is false positive and uses drugs? And the answer is no, they could not both happen at the same time. So it's a disjoint. Number 10 is disjoint. Maybe we need to look at a few more of those. Well, it's only one single event. We're trying to decide if within one single event you can select a person that has these two characteristics. If you can, then they overlap and they're not disjoint. If you can't, then they're disjoint. All right, number 11, randomly selecting a drug screening result and getting one that is a false positive randomly selecting a drug screening result and getting one from someone who does not use drugs. Not disjoint. False positive and does not use drugs. Yeah. Number 12. And we can go back to the table if we have to. I mean, these answers are a result of that table. Um, let's see. I'll stop here. Pull that off. Let's look back at the table. That may be why some of you are confused as to whether it being disjoint or not disjoint. Here's the table. Let's, and I don't think I got both at 12, so um, it's got one of them for some reason. Let's look back at those two. Number 10 is disjoint. Number 11 is not disjoint. Okay? This was disjoint. This was not disjoint. But let's look at why. Randomly selecting a drug screening result and getting one that is a false positive. All right, so. What was a false positive? That was whenever you do not use drugs and you have a positive test result. Okay, so randomly selecting a drug screening result and getting one that is a false positive, randomly selecting a drug screening result and getting one from someone who uses drugs. So if they got a false positive, they are not a drug user. So those do not overlap. So that means that the two events would be disjoint. All right. Number 11, randomly selecting a drug screening result and getting one that is a false positive. It's this one down here. And then randomly selecting a drug screening result and getting one from someone who does not use drugs. These are the ones that do not use drugs. So they overlap. So they're not disjoint. It probably makes those last couple, I'm sure, make a lot more sense if you're looking at the table.
if you were to think about the events, because remember, when we're talking about disjoint or non-disjoint, we're thinking about events and whether those two events could happen in one single trial. If the two events are disjoint, a Venn diagram representation of those two events Let's see. There's, there's a Venn diagram of how they would look if they were not disjoint, meaning they overlapped. Like this is the probability of A, that's the probability of B, and they overlap. So that's this right here in the middle, this is where they overlap, the probability of A and B. If they are disjoint, then those outcomes do not overlap. Cannot overlap. Like the probability of me selecting someone in here and then being a male and a female. All right? If I select one person, they're either going to be a male or a female. All right? You know, I have already told you though, make sure when applying this addition rule, do not double count. That means counting the place where you overlap. All right, that your book just kind of cautions you about that again. Okay, complementary events in the addition rule. So in the last section, you know, we went over what a complementary event was. So if if the probability of something happening, let's say equal to 0.3, the probability of it not happening would be equal to 0.7, right? Because I told you that. the probability of something happening plus the probability of it not happening is equal to 1. So the probability of something not happening is equal to 1 minus the probability of it happening. Okay. Sometimes this can save us a lot of time um, working a problem. Maybe not in this section but on down the road. Your book says, common sense dictates this principle. We are certain, with probability one, that either an event A occurs or it does not occur. So it follows that the probability of A or not A is equal to one. Because events A and not A must be disjoint, we can use the addition rule to express that common sense principle as follows. You gotta like common sense principles, right? Probability of A or not A, this is what I just showed you, is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of not A is equal to 1. All right. All right. Which brings us to the problems at the back of the section. We've already looked at some of the um, are these disjoint type problems. How about we look at a complement or two. Let's say like number 14 here. Let's take a look at this one. Online courses. According to the National Association for College Admissions Counseling and the USA Today, 19.8% of college students take at least one online class or one class online. What is the probability of randomly selecting a college student who does not take any college courses online? Okay, so if the probability, I'm just going to say O for online, the probability of selecting an online student, if you randomly select one college student, is 0.198, right? 19.8%. Now we want to find what is the probability that they do not take an online, so I'm just going to draw uh, a bar above O for not online. The probability of getting a student who does not take an online course has to be equal to 1 minus the probability that they take an online course. So that would be 1 minus 0.198 or 0.802. Right? Okay. 
pretty easy to understand. It's not a complicated uh, concept. Sometimes the way the problems are worded, it can be a little confusing, though. So if you're not sure what the problem's asking, you know, don't think that reading the problem a couple times is a bad thing. A lot of times it's a good thing. All right. So here's a couple of uh, probability problems, 17, 18, 19, and 20. Those refer back to that same table that we were using earlier. So if this is still a little confusing to you, that may be a couple of problems you would want to work out. Work out the odd problems and then uh, you know, check the odd answers. And if you need any of the even answers, I can give those to you. Um, let's see. I'm going to make a copy of this table so we can get some fresh problems. I'm going to make sure that I include the directions in the table. thought I was selecting. Now I'm selecting. And the reason I'm doing that is because it's on a different page. And with the ebook, you don't want to go to the next page, right? Because then you can't really look back. So I'm going to throw these up here now. Um, so I'm going to have to resize a little bit so that we can see both <coughs> of these at the same time. All right, well, let's read through the directions, and then we can look at each problem. In exercises 21 through 26, use the data in the accompanying table, which lists the numbers of correct and wrong dosage amounts calculated by physicians. In a research experiment, one group of physicians was given bottles of epinephrine labeled with a concentration of one milligram in one milliliter solution. And another group of physicians was given bottles labeled with a ratio of one milliliter of a one to one thousand solution. The two labels describe the exact same amount and the physicians were instructed to administer 0.12 milligrams of epinephrine. The results were reported in the New York Times. Okay, so here are the results. Now let's look at problem number 21. If one of the physicians is randomly selected, what is the probability of getting one who calculated the dose correctly? Okay, so I would hope that every doctor calculated the dose correctly. Just uh, in my opinion, being someone who's had to been I've been put under a couple times for minor surgeries or whatever. Um, but let's look here: correct dosage calculation. So this is with the different lab labels, right? It looks like one of the labels is a lot more confusing than the other. It was probably that second label. But uh, let's see. So calculated the dose correctly would be, what, 11 plus 2? That's how many were calculated correctly. Eleven plus two divided by we need to figure out the total amount. So we have eleven plus three plus twelve plus two. So what would that be? Twenty-eight. So that's thirteen over twenty-eight or If we rounded that to three significant digits, 0. 0.464. It's about 0. 0.464. All right. Then the book asks, is that probability as high as it should be? So would you feel comfortable if when you went to the doctor that there was a 46.4% chance that the doctor would get your medicine right. No. So, yeah, it's almost a half, but still. I'd hate to flip a coin and say, okay, am I getting the right dosage or not? All right, and then it become, comes time to, to have my neck operated on, and I didn't have enough anesthesia, so I'm just sitting there dealing with it, and that probably wouldn't be good. All right. All right, number 22. 
If one of the physicians is randomly selected, what is the probability of getting one who calculated the dose incorrectly? Well, there's two ways we can do this. Yeah, you could use the complement. See, because we're doing not correct. So the two ways that I would say that you could do this is you could say the probability of it um, not being correct would be equal to 1 minus the probability that they correctly found it. So that would be 1 minus 13 over 28 or that's what 15 over 28 and then you could find that as a decimal so point five three six so that's one way another way to find that answer I wouldn't use the decimal because the decimal was rounded and that may cause some problems sometimes. So if you can ever afford, especially in this class, but if you can ever afford not plugging in rounded values, that's for any class that you ever take, then don't plug in rounded values. All right, but if you, if you have to, you have to, so. All right, so the other way would be to say three plus 12 divided by 28. All right, and so it gives you the same answer, right? We still get 15 over 28, or about 0.536. All right, let's look at the next question. All right, so we're going to do two more. Number 23, if one of the physicians is randomly selected, find the probability of getting one who made the correct dosage calculation, or was given the bottle with a concentration label. So we have to look at the table. So we want to know correct dosage, which is this column, or concentration label, which is this row. So just make sure you don't count 11 twice. So 2 plus 11 plus 3, that's 11 plus 5, 16 over 28. All right, that can be reduced before you divide, but dividing it like it is is fine. 16 divided by 28, so 0.571. The last one we're going to look at in this section. If one of the physicians is randomly selected, find the probability of getting one who made a wrong dosage calculation or was given the bottle with a ratio label. So here's ratio label 2 and 12. Wrong dosage calculation 3 and 12. So you say 3 plus 12 plus 2. That's what's 5 plus 12 is 17. Over the total number 28. The other way of finding that would have been to say 1 minus 23 because the way the problems were, but we can do it like this too. 17 divided by 28, got to calculate another calculator coming up, but just ignore that one. So 0.607. So that finishes this section.